few breakfasts, we focused on working with our partners to create and, and implement strong alcohol policies throughout our communities. Today, we're going to continue that theme, but narrow our focus on responsible beverage sales and service. And our keynote speaker is an expert on this topic. As the former owner of two Orange County nightclubs, Greg Hennar endured hefty legal bills and rising insurance costs tied to a bunch of alcohol-related problems that were traced back to his bars. At one time on the brink of closing, he created a culture of responsible alcohol sales, which caused his businesses to thrive while many others around him, his competitors, closed. Greg is now a consultant. He works with a bar, restaurant, and nightclub owners to implement procedures that help make them profitable without hurting the communities in which they're located. He's extremely active in his community. He serves on the Orange County DUI Task Force and Steering Committee, the Orange Coast College Advisory Committee for Alcohol Prevention Grants, and the California Strategic Highway Safety Plan, Challenge Area 1 Task Force. Interestingly, he's also the author of a book that was published just last year entitled A Business Approach to Drunk Driving. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Greg Hanar. Business approach to reducing your drug driving. <laughs> it's not how to get drunk. We all know how to do that. Um, thank you for inviting me. A special thank you to Eric for making all this happen. It wasn't easy getting me down here. Um, so let me get all my PowerPoints. Initially, I told Eric I would have like five PowerPoints. Then I sent him an email with 54. <laughs> He's coming down to 40. And probably need to have that. Yes. Can't hear me. Okay. Can I help you? Oh. This is trying to recognize my guess. Oh, <laughs> over there. <laughs> Should she uh, introduce herself? Sure. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Raquel Vasquez, council member for the city of Monroe. Thank you. Uh, so the book, I'm here to talk about ideas and recommendations in the book for business approaches and reducing drunk driving. The focus of the book, ideas on what cities can do to reduce the level of intoxication inside their drinking establishments. The book draws on uh, heavily on research studies, like 20 years as an operator, eight years doing volunteer work on numerous different task force, and actually a lot of lessons learned at 3M, where I worked for 10 years in the orthopedic division as a quality control supervisor and then a technologist. Technologist is a non-technical degree in engineer. <laughs> See here. Do I get the PowerPoint yet? Here, this is all kind of new to me. Here. Um, let's see here. There you go. There you go. Okay. One thing 3M drilled into me was the importance of having a goal to drive any process. So here's today's goal: identify three steps cities can take to reduce the amount of high-risk intoxication inside the drinking establishments. Not loud enough. Okay. Um, not just cut in half, not just reduce, but cut in half the amount of high risk intoxication. What is high risk intox intoxication? Some people probably would say any amount of intoxication is risky, and that can be the case. Experts typically peg high risk intoxication at a BAC of 0.15 or higher. Why do we care so much about high risk intoxication? Well, studies also demonstrate. Those with higher BACs cause a disproportionate higher percentage of harm to themselves and others. 
look to your right, look to your left. Come on, play along with me here. I've got the microphone now. One in three will be involved in an alcohol-related car accident in their life. If you're that unlucky one person to be involved in that car accident, hope the driver does not have a BAC of 0.15 or higher. With 70% of DUI fatalities, at least one driver has a BAC of 0.15 or higher. So that's what I'm targeting. That's what I think our focus should be on, reducing those that level of intoxication. There's good news. Researchers, multiple studies have shown that moderate drinkers really aren't the problem. They are not statistically at a significantly higher risk of harm to themselves and others. Do they cause more problems than non-drinkers? Yes, but not at a significant level. The focus, again, is on high risk levels of intoxication. Alcohol is not the problem. It's the abuse of alcohol, in my mind, and research studies suggest that, again, it's the abuse of alcohol which is the problem. The question becomes, how do we do, how do we reduce the intoxication? How do we get people inside drinking establishments to cut people off? Can servers identify those reaching before they get to a 0.15? Can servers, a trained server, can they identify people approaching that level? The operative word here is not trained in my mind, actually. The operative word is can. Can they? They can. I, 20 years experience tells me a, a server, a trained server, if they're motivated and they're focused, they can cut someone off before they even get close to 0.15. Do they? No, they don't. I, I, who, who in here is an operator? Show of hands. Just one? Operator. Operator in the business sells alcohol? Just one, two. Okay. Hopefully you do cut your people off, and again, if you do, that's great. Realize studies suggest that's an anomaly. That's not typical. I know that when I cut them off, they leave, and some people continue to serve them. You're right. Studies would suggest that's exactly what happens. So the question really becomes, how can we motivate owners and managers to cut off people? Because it just doesn't happen. Well, my solution is to eliminate information gaps. I think most owners are very good people. I could tell story after story up here of wonderful people. If I brought them up here and you listen to their talk, they're really no different than anyone else here. They're, they happen to sell alcohol for a living. I also can acknowledge, I can tell stories about each of these people that demonstrate they don't do it responsibly. And I think there's ways to get these people to do that. And again, it's about filling information gaps. Information gaps exist within cities, especially within the planning departments, within alcohol operations, in between operators and the police. Can, can people hear me OK? Because occasionally it sounds like this cutting in and out. OK? Yes. Bye. By sharing my, briefly sharing, my journey to open and run two iconic nightclubs, I think, in Orange County. I think that's fair to say. Uh, since there's no one here to dispute that, they were iconic nightclubs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's true. One was actually on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. Okay. Um, by sharing what it was like to open these places and run these places, I hope to demonstrate where these information gaps are. Then we'll circle back to see how to fill these information gaps. Both clubs required receiving a CUP, and I think everyone in here probably knows CUP is for conditional use permit. Um, both clubs required that. Both clubs required, obviously, getting a liquor license. To get a CUP, you go through, well, there's a lot of things you do. Maybe what you do more than anything else is meet with the planning department. We had multiple meetings with the planning department. Eventually, we had meetings with planning commissioners. We had a public hearing with the planning commissioners. The Shark Club actually required a public hearing also with the city council. In all these meetings, not one time did anyone talk to us about alcohol service. From where I'm at now, that's bizarre. 
that time it didn't even seem that bizarre because there's so many things they are telling you to do. But they're giving you great information. And these people were very professional, very talented, extremely knowledgeable. Their focus was not talking to us about alcohol service. Eventually, both clubs received CUPs. Well, between the two CUPs, we had dozens of conditions. We received their alcohol license. We had conditions in their alcohol license. Between those four documents, well, the Shark Club alone had 36 conditions, 13 just about parking. In all these dozens of conditions, not one condition about alcohol service. These were our marching orders. These told us what the city cared most about, what we needed to focus on. We had amazing parking. We had great signage, architectural, I mean, landscaping. Everything they asked us to do, we focused on. We understood this was, was important to the city. Nothing about alcohol service. Nothing about alcohol service even in our liquor license. None of the conditions. Now, are they embedded within a, a business code and penal codes? Yes. As far as what was discussed, nothing. Did I jump ahead? Perhaps I did. This is our first information gap. So I'll let you pause on this and just read what I just said. Um, what are our first information gaps here? City planners do not typically, and if there's exceptions in here, I'm sure there must be because I keep hearing how advanced uh, San Diego is, and that's great. But typically, city planners do not know the science that would enable them to properly condition an alcohol operator. When I started writing this book, my focus was on just about talking about RBS and the power of RBS and the benefit that can come from RBS. I started asking myself, why don't cities typically ask operators to do RBS, among other things? 78% of California cities, the best guesstimate is by a research group, 78% of California cities do not mandate any kind of RBS, do not put anything in their CUP relating to how to serve alcohol. So what I went through was typical. The reason planners don't put conditions in there, they aren't taught how to do it. I contacted the five leading universities in the United States on urban planning. The number one job for an urban planner is to become a city planner. Not one program taught anything about the science, about the best practices, on how to condition an alcohol operator. There's a second reason why on the job, the planners on the job do not learn how to. I mean, there's a lot of things we don't learn in college that we you know, learn on the job. Probably the biggest reason the planners don't put anything inside uh, their uh, uh, CUPs. They think the ABC is going to do it. It's time and time again over the years that I've talked to planners, wonderful, professional, dedicated people, that I hear that's the ABC's job. Well, you know what? It's not the ABC's job. I understand why everyone thinks it's the ABC's job, but it never even was the ABC job. They're limited by statute what they can ask of an operator. They can't put in there that you have to document policies and procedures. They can't tell you you have to do training. Not with a new licensee. Once you're in trouble, there's other things they can do. But with any new licensee, they can't demand these things. They can't even demand that, they, that the um, applicant even take their own lead class, their own training class, they can't demand an occupant or an applicant. So it's really up to the cities to ask these questions of uh, the new applicants. Okay. Let's see, we probably just turned this thing off. Um, well, we've seen our CUPs, obviously, our alcohol licenses. We created two iconic nightclubs. Um, running a nightclub is probably a little, every job has challenges. Running a nightclub has kind of challenges that would probably bizarre. We actually had someone come into our club during the day, during one of my manager meetings, dressed up as an SCE electrician, saying here's check our lines. So during our meeting, we went into our electrical box and cut all the lines, you know, so we could not open that night for a new promotion we were doing, which is a felony, by the way. Turns out my manager on the way to this meeting actually saw the same guy at the gas station, but anyway, 
So we had to be wired. I mean, those are the type of bizarre things you deal with in a nightclub. Then there's noise complaints. We had someone across the street who complained about noise. Well, we took all, all complaints seriously, especially since he was a lawyer. I actually went over to his place. He had, for some strange reason, been built kind of a loft bed against the window, elevated loft bed against this tiny window, which would vibrate from the back of the base coming from the club. So I would lay in his bed with the walkie-talkie. My brother would be in the club. We would be adjusting um, the, the stereo system to try to prevent him from hearing the music. It didn't work. It just, he created a, a, like a vibration room. So we had to fill in all of our windows, which there are tons of windows on the street, which we love having that presence that people could look in. We filled them all in with concrete. Those are the type of things you have to do to work with your neighbors. And then we put limiters on our sound systems. We had a commercial neighbor complain about trash. We changed the protocol for security at the end of the night. Everyone went through the neighborhood. Then we had the cleaning crew come out earlier in the morning. They did another sweep. Because if anything was left, even had nothing to do with our business, we were going to be accused of it. And that's okay. We didn't want anyone to even assume we were doing anything wrong. We were a pretty good operator. There was one thing I could not get a handle on, and that was alcohol abuse. Really, it's alcohol abuse. Did I know from day one that there was a problem with, uh, make, did I make a connection between problems inside the club and alcohol? If, you, you can't, you can't have, I mean, you're, you're ignorant if you can't make that connection. I mean, when you're, I was the guy doing it, I was so, weird, so stupid when I first started. I didn't even have security. Well, that, that changed in about a day. Um, but still, I was the one on the floor helping to carry people out, talking people down. You know, you know they're drunk. Now, why didn't I do anything about it? First, I didn't know what to do about it. It seemed to be a bigger problem than I could handle. And frankly, when you're first open, you're going, why is this stuff closing me down? I mean, this is kind of crazy. The police were showing up all the time. Uh, just some of the bizarre things that happen when people jump. I had one of my brothers, we would not let go into a private room with this MTV party. He jumped my security guard. We had to kick him out. And they six him for a month. Um, we had an off-duty police officer bite the ear off, part of an ear off of another customer. You know, the things when people do when they're drunk, everyone, the people who grab them more than anyone else are drunk lawyers. That's true. Um, but anyway, so we just really didn't get a handle on it. And it's kind of, I almost call it benign neglect because I knew something was going on. After a while, you went, God, they're not shutting us down. And it just, and you know, you know you're doing better than, well, frankly, we were doing better than our competitors. Security staff, the very close knit group, we would hear all the stories about what's going on in our competitors. And they were having major problems. They would actually beat up their, you know, my security staff, they saved, saved me. Uh, we treated our customers well when there was an altercation. That's not necessarily typical. We were hearing all kinds of stories about people being beat up, taken to the back. No, I mean, that's not typical, but it's not that unusual. Um, and we, we were quite proud of how we were doing. We thought we were better than most operators, and we were. But we actually used to keep track of the number of operators that closed down. We did that for 10 years. We were quite proud that we lasted. One of the operators that closed down, when they first opened, they were so impressed with their own success, they pulled a pickup to in front of the club, the ballet station, they pushed an old oven out onto our parking lot to suggest they're toasted because they're the new kids on the block. And they were busy for a year or two, then they got closed down. In fact, at that location, what finally prompted, they should have been closed down the first week, frankly, they were so bad. Um, there was an arrest and the staff actually pulled the arrested person out of the police car. Um, that, I think that was finally the straw that broke the camel's back. But again, we used to keep track of who would close down, feel very good about ourselves. That changed after our second club, Metropolis, got closed down. It's actually not an easy thing to talk about. Um, six months prior to Metropolis closing down, which is in Irvine, Shark Club, the Costa Mesa, I had left the club 
in a dispute with my older brother. He, uh, majority owner, uh, a great guy, smart guy, the most conservative person I've ever known. Uh, he was going through his second childhood to 120 beats per minute. He had discovered electronic music. On a Thursday night promotion, he went from the back of the house, which is his responsibilities, to the front of the house. His behavior wasn't in accordance with the policies and procedures and the training everyone received. After butting heads with him for quite a, did I mention he's a control freak? <laughs> I just decided for my own mental health I had to leave. So I went only back, he's general manager at both locations. I went back to the Shark Club, brought my younger brother over, many years younger, to help him run the front of the house for Metropolis. I got a call at 4.30 in the morning, six months after I leave, left the club, you know, left Metropolis, indicating my brother John had been arrested for giving drugs to an undercover agent. Now, why was the club even open at 4.30? Because, again, this was John's second childhood. This was the kind of music he loved, and a DJ who was flown in from Europe. And he just kept it open. We weren't making any money. He actually had the nerve to have my younger brother bring a big bucket full of beer into his room where he was partying after 2 o'clock. This points out the second information gap. Owners, operators typically feel they are immune from problems. Because frankly, almost every night we have problems. And I don't know about other operators here, I wish we had more. But it's kind of shocking that people don't talk about this earlier. But typically what happens, the police create a file, they prepare a case, and when that file gets thick enough, when the case gets strong enough, they close you down. In between, there's not a lot of communication. In our experience, zero. Are there exceptions? There's great exceptions. I'm working with Fullerton in Orange County right now. They have 54 ABC licenses within four city blocks. They are doing an amazing job engaging the operator right now. And in doing that, what's going to happen? These operators are going to turn around, and some of them are not going to turn around, and they're going to get closed. But it's not going to take two to three years to have it happen. Now, why do we have this information gap? For the same reason I think we had the first information gap. Most people turn to the ABC to fix these problems. It makes sense. If I'm a police officer, if I uh, file a report, if I fill out a report, by law, I'm supposed to contact the ABC and give them that information. Once that licensee becomes a problem location, a disorderly house, any time as a police officer I even visit the location, let alone write a report, if I just visit the location, I'm supposed to notify, notify the ABC. What does that suggest? That the ABC is going to take care of the problem. Well, are they staffed to care, take care of the problem? No, in fact, they never really were staffed to take care of the problem. But their staffing is half what it was years ago. In Orange County, there's 3,400 on sale operators. There must be another 10 to 20,000 off sale, maybe it's even more than that. How many agents on a typical Friday or Saturday night are out in the field? Four. They have a total staff of eight, and any particular night, there's four. I can see why the police, though, think that it's the responsibility of the ABC. They send all the reports, so you would assume something's going to happen there. But it takes years to close bad operators. That needs to change. All right, where are we here? Feedback is critical. In fact, I think these may be your words. These words, did you take this out of my book? You did? Okay, these are my words. Okay. <laughs> um, like anyone doing any job, you need feedback. You need to know how you're doing. The more feedback you get, the more motivated you are. The more you're engaged with the person giving you the feedback, the more committed you're going to be. Okay, back to the timeline. One club remained, I was clueless what to do. I looked at the problems harder. It was very obvious there was a common thread that ran through all of my problems. I did not want to lose the Shark Club. We just lost Metropolis. Losing a million dollars is not easy. Frankly, for me, what was much harder was having 100 people lose their jobs. These were people I hired and trained that trusted me um, to a certain degree, at least. 
That's a difficult thing. I do not want that to happen against the Shark Club. Whether it was noise complaints, vandalism, police calls, fights, assaults, higher insurance rates, legal fees, everything, again, was tied to over-serving. And again, I did not know what to do. Was I unusual in not knowing what to do? No. Unfortunately, that's just kind of the standard out there. Other exceptions is great exceptions, I'm sure. I frankly don't know of an exception. Personally, I know quite a few people in the industry, but I also know there has to be great exceptions out there as far as people understanding how to run, how to serve, how to manage alcohol service. Just to try to give you a sense of how typical this situation, one club closing, the other club not knowing really what to do in order to keep itself going. I contacted people in Orange County that were very familiar with the drinking scene, owners, managers, promoters, asking them to tell me of places that were closed down by either the city or state, despite great traffic, great um, thriving sales of foot traffic, they were closed down by the city or state, or they closed down due to excessive insurance costs or due to fin uh, financial burdens from legal fees. This is the list they gave me. Now keep in mind, 65% of these names here are located, or businesses with, located within four cities, four of Orange County's 34 cities. Many of these places opened, uh, they closed and reopened, sometimes on the same name, sometimes on di different names. So the list is obviously much, much bigger. These, again, from four cities, the cities essentially that these people I surveyed worked in. Also keep in mind that if a place closes down due to excessive legal fees or insurance costs, there's one culprit. It is excessive alcohol consumption. Sandy Baldinger, who writes insurance for more than 3,000 establishments across the nation, states that in 99% of his claims, excessive alcohol consumption is involved. And Sandy won't back down from this number. I'm like, come on, Sandy, that has to be an exaggeration. Well, maybe it is an exaggeration, but he won't back down from that number. So back to the club. Well, this brings us to information gap number three. Operators, there's no place for an, an operator to go to learn how to do their job. If you, if you check, like, if you think it's in college, first of all, I haven't an operator yet who got a food and beverage degree. But even if you check out those degree programs, they don't teach you how to manage alcohol sales. They teach you, some of them teach you a, a sliver of RBS, which is not about how to manage a business. It's about how to recognize that someone's approach intoxication, essentially. There's no course that teaches someone how to connect the dots between your business problems and your alcohol service that demonstrates and makes financial sense to cut people off. And I can prove to you, actually, that it does make financial sense to cut off people. And then lays out a blueprint for what an operation can look like that's going to do it right. There's no such course. Researchers and these papers I've been going over for quite a while now one of the, the mantras in these papers, reoccurring themes is there needs to be a course that teaches people how to do this job, that motivates the owners so that they, they enforce the RBS training that the service receive. Back to Shark Club. I had no idea what to do. Keep in mind, I have a business degree, ran a quality department for many years, um, where I passed every FDA audit. Um, I used to actually travel the country evaluating the supply, the control systems of my suppliers. And if they didn't, in some of the smaller operations, did not have great control systems or no system, so I'd actually implement statistical quality control. So I mean, my background is all about systems, yet I had no idea how to control drinking inside my own establishment. Out of desperation, I contacted MAD. It was the only organization I knew of that was connected to alcohol. I met a wonderful lady that I wish I could remember her name. Met for coffee a couple of times. She pointed me in the direction of RBS. Within a couple of weeks, I was down here in San Diego with my manager taking a TIPS training intervention class to become a trainer. When we got done with that class and went back to Orange County, it was like we had just been exposed to a holy grail. I mean, we were so pumped up. 
I had my first kind of weapon or tool. So it wasn't just Greg telling 100 people, my, you know, this is what we need to do. I had someone else saying this is a good idea. And I had all the stuff I could point to. So we completely revamped our business. Is that typical that a manager or owner goes and is exposed to RBS and then they revamp their whole business? Not at all. But not too many people have just lost a business. I was extremely motivated. Number two, again, I had a systems background. One thing that makes 3M extremely unique, everyone talks about innovation. 3M, one of 3M's key goals is 25% of their sales within one year need to come from products introduced in the last five years. That's what it was when I was there. I just read recently, now it's a third of their sales need to come from products introduced in the last four years. So they're constantly reinventing themselves. They excel at systems thinking. They drill that into me. So I took the RBS, combined it with systems thinking, which in a nutshell is this. You identify your goal. It's a much more test than this, but this makes sense. You identify the goal, you define the process, the methods, and you, mon you monitor it, and then you create a feedback loop to make sure that you're constantly improving that uh, movement towards your goal. I applied it to the Shark Club. The goal was obvious. We wanted to serve as possible. We wanted to make sure everyone got home safely. The methods, these are some of the methods. The methods I could feed onto a PowerPoint that they're so small I can't read. Um, but essentially, we trained everyone at RBS. I changed how I interviewed people. My, the focal point of my interviews, which of course have been long, especially security, an hour and a half. Um, the focal point I had to do was how they contributed to our number one goal, which was to serve responsibly. We would role play out asking their experience. They understood from that interview that what the number one thing I wanted out of them, not is how much experience they had doing their job that I'm interviewing for, whether it's bus or whether it's bartenders, whatever it happened to be. The number one thing I wanted them to do there is to make sure people did not drink too much there and we got them home safely. And everyone there had a role in doing that. We changed all of our policies and procedures, created new policy procedures. We changed our job descriptions, our training checklists. Probably one of the more important things we did created an alcohol awareness sheet. We cannot train everyone in tips the first day they start. It's a six hour class. We would wait till we get a handful of people. But it makes no sense to me that someone serves alcohol before they're trained. So we created a mini training sheet that included the best information from lead and best information from RBS, or in this case, tips. So that before someone could serve, they had to pass this test. And went into the file, they signed away their life. So many more things we did. We had designated driver program that started off with the contest. We had someone from MAD come in and share her heartbreaking story about losing her parents to drunk drivers. That everyone, you know, was very moved. At this event, we also awarded a thousand dollars to the person who won our designated driver program. She also received a gold leaf cash caddy and tray. Uh, we had Lee come in at that time. I think she's actually retired with Sally Bishop. To show you how unusual this was, only one person for the whole state, the ABC only had one person for the whole state would actually go into the operator's location and teach people. So we trained everyone, including the kitchen, kitchen staff and lead. Maybe the second most important thing that we did, we changed how we cut off people. No longer was the bartender or server responsible to do cutoffs. Of course, it was mandatory. They had to make sure it got done, got done and they, they did not ever serve. I made it easier for them by saying, these are specially trained security personnel. And I selected my most personable people who like people the most, have good communication skills, personally trained them. We did a lot of role playing. Those people did by far the bulk of our cutoffs. Server and bartender could still do the cutoff if they felt they had a special rapport with the customer. 90 plus percent of the times they turned to the security and just made it much more likely it was going to happen when they designated someone to do it someone who had the skills to do it too. And of course, they had to get paid more. We had 86 people who um, had drinking problems. We had to continuously cut off. Uh, let's see. I think that's the key points there. So how did we monitor this? Managers walked the floors looking for intoxication, of course. One thing they started adding to their floor walking 
with checking out tabs. If they saw something that looked a little unusual, they'd ask to check out the tab. Um, the, and 50% of the people have tabs, use credit cards. If security identified someone who was drunk before the server or bartender, that was a big no-no. The server, should, the server knows how many drinks they're giving that person. They're making that exchange with that person. They should typically be able to pick, pick out who should be cut off before security. So when security needed to identify someone first, automatically the management would review the tab. And again, half the time that was capable of doing. Then half the time you just ask questions to the servers. So they knew there would be feedback. They knew you were watching them. I hired an undercover former Texas Ranger who was quite an oddball to look and told the staff ahead of time we were doing this at a big uh, 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 club meeting. So we knew we were doing this. Still, despite that, we caught one of the more popular servers there serving shots to someone that was already drunk. She got terminated. There's no second chances when serving when it comes to hitting someone or when it comes to serving to someone who should not be receive alcohol. Another key thing we did, and in some ways maybe the most important one, every day I would review the incident log. And almost every day something's recorded in the incident log. Might not be big, but there's something. I would always, the, the managers knew I was looking at the log. The managers expected me to ask them the background of what happened. Did alcohol play a role? And if it did, what did they do? What kind of research did they did? What kind of feedback to the staff did they give? Was, did, was someone negligent? And I knew that was going to happen. So they needed to anticipate that. So the managers took control of the problem, in other words. The feedback group was essentially manager meetings. I would begin every manager meeting, which at that time were weekly, asking them how we were doing, what did we need to change. From that, we actually had a slew of more policies and procedures. Uh, for example, private parties. We realized that one of the weak links here was private parties. It's almost like you train your customer, frankly, when you do this. You're cutting off a lot of people initially when you implement this, and then they learn that they're going to be kicked out if you 86 them. So you actually, it's interesting. You do educate your customer in going through this. Some just need to be you know, 86. But with private parties, we realized it was a different animal. Private parties, you could have people that were kind of professional partiers. They think since they booked a room or bought a bottle, they could do anything they wanted. And then we had the other group of private party people, like corporate parties, like Disneyland would come in there, and you know, big companies. And this was their annual event, a Christmas party, for example. <laughs> well, you have a lot of amateur drinkers. In some ways, the amateur drinkers are the worst people. They're not, they don't know, you know, if you have three shots and then, oh, you're drunk, you know? Um, so what we started doing is communicating when they're booking the parties, both in written form and verbally, what our, what our policies were on drinking. And we, we recruited them to make sure, A, they communicated that to their party goers, and they helped us enforce it. So we talked to, talked to them about it on the phone. It was included in the reservation sheet they had to sign. And when they arrived at the event, we reminded them of that. And that, you know, so constantly you're reinventing yourself, even what your process is here, because you're defining new chinks in your armor. Obviously, the problem significantly dropped. Let's give them the uh, steps cities can take, the three steps cities can take now to reduce the amount of uh, high risk intoxication. These are the three, we're going to jump ahead here, because we're going to talk about one at a time. Number one, to address the issue of information gap we earlier identified as far as lack of communication with new applicants. Cities need to communicate constantly. The number one message a new applicant needs to hear is that they, the city expects them to serve responsibly. I mean, I'm going to hear about landscaping, I'm going to hear about signage and parking, but I need to hear, number one, that the city cares about this. I strongly recommend creating talking points. In fact, I had two talking point slides in here. <laughs> um, and if you'd like to see what those talking points are, just email me and I'll send you the talking points. Um, I was asked to present a seminar at 3 a.m. on pinpointing. Pinpointing is a management tool to make sure when you're asking somebody to do a job, you're very specific and very clear on what you want them to do to achieve some specific goal. Talking points accomplish that. 
There's another advantage to creating talking points. It forces the city, whether it's the planners, planning commissioner, city council, the police, to come together and define what should be in these talking points. What is our mission statement? What is our goal with alcohol operators? It's a step towards, obviously, ownership. I would recommend even having a name for it, a community dedicated to safe roads or a safe community. When you're talking to an applicant, tell them what your mantra is. Maybe have them sign a scroll. Tell them, give them some statistics, which I used to have in here on the slides. But share with them why the city cares. 40% of falls, 50% of homicides, 64% of burns and you know, fires, and all of the statistics. There's tons of them out there to demonstrate why the community should, does care and should care, and why the operator should care. Let them know you, what's, you know, the fire you have in your stomach about this, what it's based on. Give them an opportunity for them to get engaged early on. Part of these talking points should include how you go about monitoring their performance. Even if you gotta exaggerate, do a scared straight component of it. There should also be very clear communication about the consequences if you don't serve responsibly. My goodness, if people would have done this to me, the other operators, when we first opened up, instead of operating in a vacuum, it will change things. There's more than needs to happen, but it's a great place to start. You also ch exchange information on what the boilerplate conditions would look like in a CUP if they got that far. I recommend, here we're going to talk about five boilerplate conditions to beef up your CUPs. And the book I mentioned, Ted, I think five is what we're going to do here. Number one. You must require your operators to document policies and procedures and how they're going to go about serving alcohol responsibly. In the book, which Eric has, and you can get from him, I actually have templates in there of policies and procedures. You may want to offer the operator templates of what a policy, the pages and pages of policies and procedures. It forces the operator to think about what are they going to do, for example, if someone shows up drunk, what's the house policy? When you cut someone off, when do you kick them out? When don't you kick them out? How do you kick them out? How do you communicate to other people and just to make sure if you don't kick them out that you know, people are watching them? How do you identify people? There's so many things, as you'll see in the template that's in the book, that an operator needs to think about. And they need to think about this before they open. Um, number two, management needs to have their staff go through RDS or lead. I personally think it should be both, but if you can do one to me, it should be RBS. Here's a study on the effectiveness of RBS. It's my favorite study because it gives the best outcome. Almost, you know, there's, study, there's so many studies on RBS training effectiveness. Almost all of them demonstrate that it moves the needle a little bit in a positive direction. Some demonstrate that it moves the needle much more in a positive direction. Almost without exception, it's, well, without exception, they only say the number one thing that moves that needle is that the manager, the owners, require that those trained RBS servers move their training, that they do cut off people. But they need to be trained. Number three, again, I find it bizarre that people are allowed to serve alcohol without any training. Require your operators to create, I don't care if it's one page, five pages, some type of nominal training. And again, there's a template in the book that Eric has. And if you email me, I'll send it to you. Um, but nominal training on lead RBS. How can you serve alcohol before you have some training? I mean, what, what message are we sending to operators that you can serve alcohol without any kind of training? It's just it's bizarre to me. Want to hear my fantasy? Who wants to hear fantasy? It's clean. Thank you. Um, did California be the first state to mandate RBS training before you serve alcohol? There's 12 states that mandate RBS training. 13 if you just say it's a manager only. But even in the states that mandate RBS training, and of course California's not one of them, the server is given 30 days minimum, usually 60 or 90 days. I've seen 120 days to complete the training. 
Well, I don't know about you, but if I have something critical in my job after consent, I don't think they ask the police to learn how to shoot after their officers. I mean, the critical parts of any job, you do before, you're required to pass some kind of competency test before you do the job. It's bizarre to me that we let our people serve. So what I'm suggesting, California, I've written the script, anyone can have it for free, they videotape a 20 minute, if they want to make a 30 minute, whatever, training online. The operator pays for it, the server pays for it. If they want to serve alcohol, they can make a lot of money eventually through alcohol. They can invest $10 or $15, take this online course, download the study guide, they take a test, they bring it into wherever they're looking for a job. I'm a certified trainer, I know how to serve alcohol. Now, is it a six-hour class? No. I frankly don't think a six-hour class is, is necessary. I think a six-hour class or three-hour class, six months after you start a job versus something before you start the job sends a much more powerful message saying you can't have this job until you learn these skills. You can do additional training down the road if you want. But that $10 to $15 that's paid to the state through this online course gets then funneled back to law enforcement in the local communities to use for enforcement. It's a no-brainer to me, it makes so much sense that it probably won't happen. Um, number four, management completes a management level course in good alcohol uh, practices. We were saying there's no such course. We'll talk about that in one second, but only for 30 seconds. Um, number five, Training records must be posted. First of all, you need to keep a training record. So when police come in and do bar checks, they can see who's been trained in here. Must be available. Keep the record, make it available to the police. Back to number four. We're going to talk very briefly about this. There needs to be a few more slides on this. As I mentioned earlier, researchers for more than 20 years have been calling for a, a class that would know the owners to do the right thing and basically enforce um, most serving to an obviously intoxicated customer, which is the law. Uh, there hasn't been a course, actually, I'm about to complete a course, it's called Good Alcohol Practices for Managers and Owners, GATMO for short. This is the mission statement for GATMO. Good Alcohol Practices makes your business more profitable, and it does, provides superior customer care, protect, protects your licenses. By the end of the class, the attendees are given a blue we're actually together, the instructor, me, um, and the attendees, we put together a blueprint of what a model organization would look like. We create a culture and systems around the, the core value of not serving uh, to an obviously intoxicated person, responsible benefit service. We show how to do it. It takes a few hours to do this, but it will, there's financial modeling that demonstrates how the operator makes money by doing this. Even though I think this is the second most important thing you can do, and former mayor Peter Mufa of Costa Mesa says he thinks it's the missing link, we're not going to talk about it anymore because it kind of smacks of self-promotion. So let's move to step number three, which is to me, by far, the most important thing cities can do. In the studies, I mean, from an experience as an operator, there's nothing more so we can do the step three to dramatically change how people are served. Studies show there's nothing that comes close to step number three in reducing serving to an obviously intoxicated person. Perform enhanced bar checks and start enforcing the law that says it's illegal to serve to an obviously intoxicated person. What is an enhanced bar check? Yes, it's a term I made up. Essentially, you have special, when talking to police about this, one, there's a couple things we agree on. One, it needs to be done in a team. You need to select the right police officers to do this the, with the strongest communication skills that really love working with people. Um, they have the right attitude about this. Essentially, a two-man team would come to an operator. They'd ask to talk with the manager. Maybe they did this once a month. They would exchange information. They could talk about kind of bills coming through. They could talk about carjacking. They could talk about latest drug issues. But the one thing they want to talk about for sure is anything tied to that operator's license. Anyone who's been arrested for a DUI tied to that operation. Any arrest 
may tie to that operation because you've got men joining wars. That no, you can't assume that. There's multiple managers at these places. And number one, we want to make sure the manager knows they are keeping track of this information. This can be done in a very professional and friendly manner, but the information needs to be exchanged. The operator needs to know they're being monitored. At some point, they do a friendly walkthrough. The officers ask the manager to escort them. They're here to help the manager enforce the policy against over-serving. Together, they walk through the establishment. At the end of it, the officers remind the manager, who at this point, after a couple of these, are going to know very well, um, remind them that undercover operations are key to what they find during these walkthroughs. And hopefully, there's truth in that. The first 10 years of the Shark Club life, we just were not a responsible seller of alcohol. The last 12 years, I said a year and a half ago, we were. Even during the 12 years, I think we did, frankly, a very good job. We would have been so much better if this took place. I asked the head of security, who was still saying head of security there, I asked Marcel, I go, what would happen if this you know, scenario played out? Because this staff would be scared shitless. And they would be. I mean, the manager, if the, I mean, I would have been the manager or the owner. But I also would have loved it. You know, in 12 years trying to get my staff and getting my staff to serve much more responsibly, you know how lame it sounds after 12 years and people have been with me eight years saying, you know, we can get arrested, we can lose a liquor license. And all that time, I could not point to one other operator that got fined. So it really becomes about our ethical duty to do the right thing, or about insurance costs, or legal fees. But it's really not you're going to get popped because you don't get popped. You don't even get the sense you're going to get popped. You need to walk through and tell them you're tracking alcohol consumption. Again, hopefully there will be truth in the statement that there, were, there, there are undercover operations, because there's nothing the city can do that's more powerful. In a study in Michigan, researchers found when they went in, talked with the operators, told them about enforcement, and then actually did enforcement, the amount of the number of the percent of customers before the study that were being cut off was 17 percent. That were drunk. Of the drunk customers, if you had 100 drunk customers, 17 theoretically were being cut off at the time. Once they did this, it went up to 54. 54%. The only thing shocking about this is that it was at 17% before the study. And the only reason they was that high, the researchers acknowledged in this county they actually did do limited fining. Well, that's not the case here in California. Generally, I mean, there's exceptions. But it's just not the case. Two studies have suggested the amount, the number, the percent of people cut off that are drunk. California is 2 to 3%. I'm, I'm, I kind of know what surprise is that high based on, you know, one of my standard questions when I interview people is, when was the last time you cut off someone? I, I swear, I never had one person every time to cut off someone. They kind of like, what? What's that question? It just does not happen. It just doesn't. I mean, the studies show it. So really, in California, if we did this, we'd go from approximately 2% of people being cut off to over 50%. If, Operators really believe they can get fined. If they really believe they can get their license suspended, they need to believe that. And they, it needs to happen, believe me. There's a lot of operators out there that need to change how they're behaving. In Orange County in 2011, there were, there are still approximately 3,400 on sale operators, not off sale, on sale. Zero violations. Not one operator fined in Orange County. That's just, to me, that's embarrassing. I mean, do I understand it? Can I explain it? Yeah, but it's still, considering the impact it has and all the work people are doing, nothing has close to the effect of reducing over-serving than operators sincerely believing they could have their license suspended. Another study Different people that did the Michigan study demonstrated that you actually save money by enforcing the over-serving laws. 
suggested for every dollar a city spent on enforcing over survey, it saves $260. And the study gets into detail how they make up that money. I'm surprised it's not more. Because when you reduce over serving, you significantly, I know for 12 years, you significantly reduce the amount of problems. You significantly reduce the amount of damage done to people, the number of arrests, the prosecution, the damage on the road, the damage on the homes. And that surprise is not more than $260 saved for every $1 spent. What this, what this study demonstrates to me is what Phil, Phil Crosby said in the 1980s. His book, Quality is Free, revolutionized the way most American businesses, or the big American corporations, especially the manufacturing corporations, but service also, it changed completely how they did business. It was kind of like the, the, the buzz book of the generation. Through detailed analysis, Crosby demonstrated that by doing things right at the beginning and preventing problems by so well, so well clearly defining what you wanted from people or from your process, you saved money. No matter, basically, whatever you spend up front made sense. Because the end result was you were going to get the, the service of the product you wanted. It was the cost of constantly trying to fix a problem, or fix a broken system, of a broken process that cost, this cost money for companies. It's the same thing with cities. Cities, most cities in San Diego, I think, are ahead of the curve. So I'm not here to insult anyone, uh, not even operators, actually. Um, they really, I don't know, to me, we call it a broken system or the lack of a system, typically, because there isn't communication early. There isn't typically the right conditioning. There isn't monitoring. There isn't really a system where you can predict an outcome. OK, enough preaching. These are just some of the examples of the costs associated by cities um, not front-loading the process to make sure the communication is clear, they have conditions, and they're monitoring. These are the habitual problems, and these are just will fit in one slide again. Our goal wasn't to see how we could save cities money. It was to how could we reduce, high, cut in half, high-risk intoxication taking place inside the licensed drinking establishments. Well, we've talked about three steps. These three steps would create a systems approach both within operators and within the city. If just step three alone, enforcement of the over-serving law, would be expected to cut in half the amount of high-risk intoxication. In addition to that, the uh, step one, changing how we go about processing new applicants, would further reduce the amount of problems. Step two, the conditions would apply to new operators, but then step two, reconditioning your existing operators would further reduce the amount of destructive drinking. That would require, of course, a deemed approved ordinance. Um, and I don't know where any cities how they're feeling about that. But by placing the, the new conditions on the old operators to drive the process to even uh, better returns. I'll close with my favorite quote. I just wish I had. I made this quote. Change how you look at things, and the things you look at change. Cities need to stop looking at this. Sometimes I think we should just pretend the ABC doesn't exist. I love the people there. The supervisor in Orange County is the most magnificent person, most helpful person. It's nothing about the personnel. It's just that they don't have enough of them. So we can't count on them. Cities need to stop looking to the ABC to fix the problem with over-serving. The more they take ownership of the problem through how they condition people, how they approve people, how they monitor the operators, you're then forcing the operators to change how they look at serving alcohol. And that's it. Thank you very much. We have uh, about 15 minutes left here, so we always have some good questions. So do you do we have any questions for Greg here in the room? I'm going to walk over here. Like a game show of those. <laughs> that was great. Uh, thank you for coming. I really enjoyed all your points. And I'm curious to 
to know the kind of reaction you get if you gave the same presentation to a business group like a chamber or to operators themselves because they tend to like to self-police and say that they'll be responsible on their own and would not necessarily embrace the idea of enhanced enforcement and oversight. It's a very good, very good question. Yeah, they're not going to ask for it. You know, I don't know how many people ask for oversight. You know, um, I have met with many owners and putting together that Gatmo training. I've met with some of the bigger owners in Orange County to get, in, frankly, to get insur insurance information, which opens the door for what I talk about with them. I mean, you know, I know these people. Some of them work for me, or you know, I, because I was able to keep a place open so long. I just have a certain type of reputation, so people will talk to me there. They actually give me their insurance records. So when they share their insurance records, it's almost impossible for them, at least, to deny what I'm saying makes sense, because they're giving me insurance records that demonstrate, for example, the biggest operator in Orange County right now, I, I don't, probably shouldn't mention the name, but they're owned by a company here in San Diego. This place is amazingly busy, but one of the, the event manager there actually used to work for me. He gives me his insurance information. They had recently bought one of their competitors in Orange County. He was chuckling as he told me this story how they bought their competitor for pennies on the dollar. But they also accepted all liability associated with this competitor. This, this competitor was nightmares for, well, still there technically, uh, but under new ownership for, uh, I guess, a dozen years now. It's amazing how it's still even open. But by the time this new owner paid off all the lawsuits, they paid more of the top dollar for a business that really had no customers anymore. So when you're talking to someone like that, it's, it's easy, you know? Another operator giving me his insurance information, he was sharing the story of, a, he was pissed off about a claim he had lost. It resulted in losing his insurance. And essentially, in a nutshell, he let people in that were already drunk. He served them more alcohol. There was an altercation. Kicked them out. He didn't hear any of the red flags in the story. It was all a matter of fact, like, this is just what we do, you know? It didn't sound strange to him that he let someone in who was drunk, and then he served them more alcohol, and then when he kicked them out, just let him linger out there that caused a brawl, who eventually caused a fire and he eventually got pepper spray, got beat up quite badly, and he sued the operator and won. Well, the operator lost his insurance. When he got no insurance, it was almost twice as much, and he didn't cover anything related to alcohol sales, which, again, is kind of meaningless insurance. A couple of years later, we actually got standard insurance. Um, so when I'm talking to people that have been in the industry and we can be open and honest about what their problems are, you know, it really isn't an issue. 